Hi, I'm Ken Jacobson, one of the programmers for Docklands, and I'm here with the directors of No Ordinary Man, Ashling, Chinyi, and Chase Joint. Welcome, Ashling and Chase. Congratulations on the film, and thanks so much for being with us here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, just you know, incredible film, so creative, um, and just so um, rich, just in all of its detail and multiple perspectives on Billy Tipton. And I want to just start by asking, you know, how did you, each of you come to know about the life of Billy Tipton? And when did the idea of making a film about him first take root? You go, Chase. Okay. <laughs> we always just trade off on who starts these things. Um, you know, as a trans person interested in trans history, I first encountered Billy Tipton on various lists and blogs. Um, authored by people who were scavenging historical records for people um, who might have been trans or with whom we could find kinship and camaraderie. But it wasn't until deep diving into this project with Ashling and our co-writer Amos Mack that I really came to understand the complexity of Tipton's life story and his legacy. And um, I discovered who Billy was essentially from making this film um, as a non-trans person. I hadn't done that research that Chase and Amos had done prior to us making a film together, but in learning about Billy and doing internet research and then finding these sort of problematic tellings and narratives of his story, um, it became clear that there was something much more complex and nuanced to who this person was and, and, uh, and to find the right way to tell his story in a contemporary way. And how did you two come together and, and form this creative partnership? And then also, you know, with, with your fellow writer, Amos? Uh, through um, community and mutual connections and, you know, Chase and I are both Canadians, so knowing uh, it's the only one step to each other in the Canadian film industry, to be fair. And um, and Amos, when Amos and I started working on the project, uh, Chase and Amos have known each other for years. So it just kind of happened sort of serendipitously, but also, you know, was was meant to be in a way that we would all find each other because of our, all of our mutual interests. I guess I would add on to that question and just say, how did, um, each of your skill sets and experiences with, you know, filmmaking kind of enhance the project. What did, what do you think you each brought to the project and then sort of together, how did that form this kind of um, powerful elixir that is, that is the film that we've seen? <laughs> today. <laughs> I love this, the, the powerful elixir. That's great. Um, you know, I think one of the things that Ash and I share is a sensibility. We're really attracted to similar kinds of stories about underdogs and underexplored heroes. And, and, you know, I come to the filmmaking table with a PhD in cinema and media studies and an interest in trans and gender nonconforming history in particular, and, and tend to become obsessed with certain kinds of questions about how we approach these stories. And, and Ash, I won't, I won't speak for you and what you imagine bringing to the table, but one of the things that I will say about our collaboration is that we're obsessed with different questions and different issues. And together we share um, uh, a really um, ongoing investment in telling, you know, one of the things that Ash says so beautifully is, we're invested in the same movie. We're invested in telling the same story and making the same movie, um, bringing in our different styles and, and, and viewpoints. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Like we, uh, Chase and I are incredibly similar in our taste and in our sensibilities and stuff like that. So um, obviously having different life experiences in a lot of ways, we still are the same age, grew up in, this, in, in the same North American culture and, and had the same pursuits and desires for what we wanted this film to be able to, or attempt to do or to ask questions that we were curious about asking a, a larger group of people. And in terms of my skill set, I, you know, started off as a producer 15, for 15 years in doc documentary and fiction. And I'm obsessed, as, like Jay said, with stories about people that we don't get to see very often on screen. And also, um, and being very character focused and finding that sort of emotional connective tissue between 
the topics and issues we want to talk about and how do you tell that in a personal and meaningful and emotional way. One of the things you know that's that's so striking about the film is the the culture's response to Billy's death, you know, in 1989 and I wondered if you could talk a bit about your experience of going through those tabloids, those headlines and articles and the talk show footage, you know, from that time period and and how that shaped your your own approach to to Billy's story and to to the film. You know, there's there's two different ways that I'll approach that question. One of which is that the presence of trans people or subjects about transness on talk shows is known in culture. It's in some ways some of the first ways in which we learned about transness in North American media cultures. And one of the things that's really striking to me is that, you know, trans people on talk shows does a kind of double duty, one of which is a kind of violent curiosity and scandal that we see produced about Tipton. But the other is it's an in point for many trans people to have recognized someone who might be a little bit like themselves, right? And so there are many trans people of my generation and those older who say, but that's where I saw potential to live a life and to find community. And it might not have been exactly like me, it might have been imperfect, but it was a recognition that someone else was there. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about our film is that we're not actually looking at trans people on the talk show circuit. We're looking at non-trans people on the talk show circuit. We're looking at Tipton's family. And that for me is a really interesting intervention into some of the, the, the now expected ways in which we come to know transness through culture. You know, there, there's an extraordinary moment speaking to that in the, um, I, I assume it's from a talk show, um, when Billy Tipton Jr. talks at length about his experience of, you know, holding Billy in his arms, his dying moments. And, you know, the poignancy of that um, story is, it, it kind of hits you like a ton of bricks. And in that moment, um, you realize, you know, with all the sensationalism uh, that was presented in the, in the mass media around his death, what kind of gets lost is that the true, and an element of tragedy around that so-called tragedy of this great reveal, you know, um, is, the is the simple tragedy of just losing someone you love. And I just wonder, you know, you were going through this material and just kind of, you used the word scavenge earlier, you know, scavenging for these nuggets. And I just wonder, you know, were there moments where you just kind of discovered things that you didn't know about Billy or about his family by looking back at a lot of these di disparate elements? I think one of the uh, things, oh, sorry, Ash. No, 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 go. <laughs> I was just gonna say, you know, to, to that point, it's, never lost on me that Billy Jr. has always identified himself as the keeper of his father's legacy and the protector of his father's life and history. And I think it's so beautifully articulated in that moment. But, you know, one of the things that we learned from spending so much time with Billy Jr. and also through our various archival pursuits is the recognition that Billy Tipton Sr you know, had an incredible sense of humor, lived an incredibly successful life, did not take himself too seriously right and there's a way in which we can use these life stories down to the serious or the tragic and there's something what quite remarkable about living in the truth of another version of someone's truth which is playful and committed and um willing to try on different ways of being for size i think you know the the approach you've taken is 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 very three dimensional to the to this portrait, you know. And I think one of the ways you, uh, you know, flesh out the various dimensions is is by bringing in all these different elements. So you've got you know archival material, you've got interviews with a variety of writers, cultural critics, and artists. You've and then of course you've got the auditions, you know, um, and the interviews that spring from that. Um, and then you've got the, the original material you shot when you, you went to visit Billy Tipton Jr. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, hats off to you both and to your whole team for balancing all of those dis different elements so effectively. 
and for, for having the audacity to take on such a creative approach. Um, but I wanted to focus for a minute on, you know, the audition idea, which in many ways is the most striking. It is a pretty audacious idea, very interesting. Um, how did this idea come, come to you as a team and, and what did you hope it would allow you to explore in terms of storytelling? So um, the, the idea of, of incorporating parts of Billy's life through a conversation that we would have with transmasculine actors and through a casting and audition process um, came, you know, quite early on, you know, because there's no moving images of Billy, of Billy that we could find. Um, there's no footage of him. So we, in order to sort of represent parts of Billy's life in his biography, we would, you know, in a traditional way would be, we would be sort of limited to photos, his album recordings, and some very few recordings that you have of his voice in rehearsals, which you hear parts of it in the film. Um, so, so Amos and I, you know, kind of just sort of blue skied like moments of Billy's life that we would have loved to have been there for when he, you know, went for his first job, met someone who, you know, had a similar experience as he did, met his icon and all of these different things. And so wrote these scenes out from the research that we did through, um, you know, reading Diane Middlebrook's book and going through her original research as well uh, and wrote out these different scenes and then when we all came together as a team and did the casting process, we did it in a very traditional way, but made it very clear that it was a documentary that we were making and that the that the footage that we would be getting from the casting tapes and the waiting room would be the material that would be actually in the film and there was no fictionalized film to be made <laughs> afterwards. And what what were for you kind of behind the scenes and it's interesting because we see you both and, and Amos there, you know, uh, on the other side of these auditions, um, you know, I'm just curious, were there some sort of light bulb moments for you as you were living through those auditions where you either learned things about, you know, Billy or just um, how, you know, people now are responding to Billy's life? Um, just curious if there were some, some standout moments for either of you in that audition process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that this is one of the shared joys of documentary is you can do as much planning as you can imagine. And then when you show up with cameras in a room with people, they take your story in new directions. And I think, you know, the enduring light bulbs for me are the moments of incredible recognition, whether it's Marquise Vilson recognizing something on the page about a life experience that Billy had and thinking out loud with us about how he might understand himself if he were there in that moment in time, or that beautiful moment where Alex Davis literally reaches across the camera to Amos, recognizing Amos as someone who was a hugely important part of his own personal becoming as a young transmasculine person. And I mean, you can't, script those, you can't make them up. And, and those to me are, are really such a significant part of the emotional heart of the film. And Amos has, uh, has the bookmark. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, Marquise is a, he's a, I mean, all, all of these actors and artists are, are incredible. Somehow Marquise, you know, jumps out partly, you know, because he's, he's African-American and it is unexpected to see, you know, uh, an African-American actor auditioning for this part of this, this white jazz musician, but also he's just, he's so articulate. Uh, so, um, and see, you know, very well-versed in, in Billy's story in the Diane Middlebrook book, you know, um, and just wondering if you can tell us a bit more about his background, because he, he was just so great in the film. Yeah, absolutely. So as part of the process, we put out a casting call and transmasculine actors self-taped to participate. And so Ash and I hung out at an Airbnb in Brooklyn now many summers ago and looked at these incredible self-tapes. And when Marquis popped up on the screen, you know, I very quickly recognized him as a hugely significant um, person in transmasculine documentary history. So he's a featured subject in a documentary called The Aggressives, which came out in 2005. And immediately I sparked thinking about, you know, what would it mean to have a conversation with someone who 
has actually been making moving image work about trans masculinity for now well over a decade. And so, you know, Ash and I basically got in contact with him and said, do you want to hang out with us for an hour so we can tell you kind of what we're thinking about this film? You know, it's about Billy Tipton, but it's also kind of not. It's also about what it means to be telling stories about trans masculine history. And, you know, one of the things that Marquise really offered up to us in that first conversation was, you know, a real commitment to making work about trans masculinity and trans masculine history through a variety of different means. And so what would it mean for his presence in a film like this? What kind of questions could we ask? And, you know, what you see on, on film is really what he brought. He, you know, his own research, his own investments and his own commitments to storytelling. Yeah, I, I think it totally shows how collaborative your process was in the, in the finished work um, and um, makes it all that much stronger. Another key coll collaborate, uh, collaborator for you clearly was, you know, Billy Tipton Jr. Um, you, you, you know, shot with him at his home. Um, what, um, when did you first reach out to him about the project? Um, and, you know, how did his involvement, uh, his inclusion in the film evolve? Mm -hmm. He was, um, you know, committed to the project from very early on. Um, the production company had reached out to Billy uh, in, you know, a couple of years even before we even got attached to the project, Chase and I, and he was always very generous and willing to talk about his father's story because as it's, you know, as it, we reveal in the film that he does feel that he is the only person carrying his father's story and to be able to represent his father's good name properly. So he was been willing to do these types of conversations and interviews. And so when when we became involved in the project, um, we reached out to him and spent uh, the most amount of time with any individual in the film was with Billy Jr. We spent three or four days with him, just hanging out in his house, you know, seeing his father's stuff, talking to him, interviewing him, hanging out, you know, chilling with his family, that kind of stuff. And so we were able to build up that trust and he was very generous of his time to let us come and invade his life for, for a week almost, you know. One, one of the, you know, remarkable moments in the interview with Billy Tipton Jr. Chase is, is when you, um, you know, you tell him, you know, your dad's story is very important to me. And you say, I'm a trans person. And a lot of people look to your dad as a kind of hero. Um, and I wondered if you could speak to, you know, your decision to kind of insert yourself in that moment uh, into, into the interview and, um, you know, what, what that was like from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, to be perfectly frank, there felt, it felt to me like there was no ethical way forward in the interview without being explicit about who I was. It was very clear to me over the many days that we spent with Billy Jr. that of course he is a product of the same media narratives about transness that we are, understanding trans people as having been positioned as liars and deceivers and untrustworthy humans. And, and you know, we are a crew full of diverse creatives, many of whom are, are trans and non-binary. And to me, that moment felt like an exchange of vulnerability. I felt like he was really offering us insight into his insides. And I felt like I needed to, in some ways, show him mine. And, you know, we were in his house with one camera. So there is no reverse shot. There's no reverse shot to even pull from. And so formally, we do get to actually just spend time with his reaction and uh, to share that space with him, as you can, I think, quite literally see him processing this new information. I Talk also would never have cut to a reverse shot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, welcome to collaboration. <laughs> hey, I edited the film. It was not going to happen. <laughs> um, the editing is is masterful, by the way. So ha, you know, con congratulations on pulling all these elements together and making it um, both flow so well and then kind of ping against each other. Um, speaking of which, you know, the the interviews with 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 your co-writer Amos and with the with the other writers and and cultural critics um, 
add yet another layer or layers to the film? How did you go about sort of casting those folks and um, what do you think, you know, they add to this, to this story? You know, our list of interlocutors is a who's who of trans contemporary criticism. And so one of the things that we did as, as a team was think, well, through what means do we want to approach Tipton's story? So what happens if we approach Tipton's life thinking about music and jazz? What happens if we think about him through the lens of trans history? What happens if we think about him through a kind of critical masculinities? And when imagining these different approaches, it became very clear who we needed to ask to animate these questions. And we felt really lucky to basically be a part of a group of thinkers, all of whom said yes, and all of whom were so happy to spend an afternoon with us. And to your point about, you know, how do you interweave a story like this? It really is through investing in, relying upon the expertise of, of these people. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we're out of time. Thanks so much, Ashling and Chase. It's been great talking with you. And thanks to our audience for joining us today. And please spread the word about this film and be sure to check out the rest of the Docklands lineup. Bye everybody.